true that people are funny about California. And you know it's true, you take two states like Florida and California, they each have their own boosters, and a person who loves California feels there is no greater love. And I wonder if we have in our audience any real dyed-in-the-wool California boosters, the kind that would just practically lay your life down for California. Let's see some hands. Hmm? You're from Florida. You stay right there. This uh, tall gentleman in the sport coat, would you come out to the aisle, please? A blonde with a... Ooh, when he gets up, there's a lot of them, isn't there? Uh, just right out here. What is your name, sir? Hank Bosch. Mr. Who? Bosch. Bosch. Yeah. Where do you come from? Bellflower. And how long have you been in California? 1940. Where do you come from when you came to California? Patterson, New Jersey. And why did you come out to California? It's beautiful weather out here. No snow. How'd you know? That's what they told me. <laughs> and now you've liked it because yeah. you've stayed. You wouldn't go anywhere else? No. I want you to talk about California. You love this state. You wouldn't go anywhere else. You think it's a great place to live. Wonderful. All right. Now, I want you to talk about it because there are a lot of people all over the country who are moving, and some of them may wonder if they should move out here. But we want to be fair about this, Mr. Bosch. We want to have both sides of the question examined thoroughly and yet interestingly. So here is my proposal to you. I'm going to give you a very nice prize of a vacation trip. If you can talk for 60 seconds steadily without any pauses, and we'll start you off talking about what a wonderful state California is. But every time you hear the bell ring, you switch to the other side of the argument. And when you hear it ring, you switch back to the good side. We'll hear both the good and the bad, and we'll give you 60 seconds, and if you can do it, you get a nice vacation trip. The time starts right now. We'll start with the good. Excuse me. Okay. Go. The best thing I like about California, you got beautiful weather, you don't have to worry about shoveling the snow and all that. And and the worst thing I hate about California, you got this, you got the fog and the smog, and you got the freeways, you got terrible fenders. If you want to go to the mountains, you got to take about an hour and a half before you get there. And that's, that's the one nice thing about California. You go to the beach in the, the beach in the winter, you can swim when it's 30 below, 40 below zero. Back, back east when it's nice weather, you can go out skiing out there, out there anytime. You don't have to go far. The kids go out sleigh ride right in front of the house, and ice skating here if you. Here if, you want, here, if you want to go, you got to go, you go miles away unless you go to an ice skating rink. That ain't much fun because then, then you just go a certain direction. You always got to keep going one way. You get tired of going one way in an ice skating rink. And you get sick and tired of the whole. One nice thing about California again, well... One nice thing, one nice thing about California, you got, good, you got good looking women down here. And, and you got the, the ocean, the breeze, you got the mountains. And... Time's up, he did it. And you know, I... Uh... For a booster of California, that was a peculiar speech. You said nine good things about California and 26 bad things. <laughs> However, you did win a trip, a 6,000-mile vacation trip. We'll put you on Greyhound Scenic Cruiser for a week's vacation at the Hotel Singapore in Miami Beach, Florida. <laughs> Isn't that sneaky? The way you talked about California, we want you to go to Florida. <laughs> Goodbye and good luck. You do, sir? How do you do? What's unusual about you? I raise rattlesnakes. They're household pets. Not in my household. What's unusual about you? I walk uh, barefooted over glass, Art. Hmm, that's a pretty sharp answer, isn't it? And what's unusual about you? I raise mongooses and train them to kill rattlesnakes. Well, it's a good thing the glass walker's in the middle. Here's a man who raises rattlesnakes for a pet, and here's a man who raises mongooses to kill the rattlesnakes. Now, personally, all of these occupations sound like lies to me, but I happen to know the two of you are telling the truth, and only one is lying. Now, it's up to our contestants selected out of our studio audience to decide which one of the three of you is, to put it mildly, a prevaricator. Could we have the guest come out, please? How do you do? Would you come right across here? 
I asked for a single young lady from our audience, and you are? Yes, I am. You are who? Karen von Anger. What sort of a name is that? It's Swedish. Von Anger. Yes. And what part of Sweden are you from? Um, are you familiar with Sweden? Yes, I'd like to be more familiar, but I mean, where, which part? Uh, Outside Stockholm, about 70 miles west. Called? Westeros. Westeros. Yes. And how long have you been here in this country? Uh, about six years now. And are you going to be a citizen? I, I became one. You became one, yes. huh? And uh, today, we are asking you to look at three men <coughs> and look into their eyes and tell us which one has the shifty look of a man who's about to tell a big lie. Now, being a single girl, you've looked into lots of men's eyes, haven't you? Yes, they're all shifty. <laughs> they're all shifty. Well, maybe that's the way a single girl looks at it. But now, here is the way the game is played. I'm going to talk to these three men, and they're going to tell us the story of their unusual occupations. And then you must pick which one you think is the liar, because two will be telling the truth and one will be lying. Would all three of you men look right into this young lady's eyes, please? Because I'm going to give you a chance to make a thousand dollars extra if you detect which one is the shiftiest before you hear anything. Which one do you pick is the shiftiest? Well, I, I think it's a man over there, but I don't want to hurt his feelings. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's all right. You have to hurt feelings, and for a thousand dollars, would you? Oh, oh I, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, now. Now you're going to get a chance to change your opinion if you want to, after you hear their stories. Now our first gentleman here, sir. Your name is? Bacigalupi. Mr. Bacigalupi, you claim you raise rattlesnakes to be pets. Don't you realize they're poisonous? Sure I do, but they won't bite you, especially when they know you. Well, how do you get to know a rattlesnake? <laughs> well, you have to raise them from little babies. There's a period of getting acquainted? Oh, yes. Are they safe when they're babies? Uh, wh at what point in a rattlesnake's life does his bite begin to be dangerous? As soon as he's born. <laughs> in other words, you have to be careful right from the start. Well, you have to uh, know the little snakes. Do you have a snake nursery, or how do you operate this kind of a business? I have a small nursery, yes. I keep them in small individual cages and take care of each one personally. Where do you get the rattlesnakes from originally? Oh, various acquaintances of mine, snake collectors and zoos, send me all their little darling babies when they're born. Have you ever been bitten? By wild ones, yes. They didn't know me. <laughs> I see. They actually know you. That's right. They do. Well, that is marvelous. And your idea back of this is to be kind to rattlesnakes? Whenever you invade rattlesnake country, if you see one, don't always be killing everything you see because you don't like it. Leave it alone. It won't bother anyone. Make friends with it. Well, just leave it be and they won't, they'll go away. They don't want to bite any human beings, believe me. <laughs> now the gentleman in the middle. <clears throat> Could you tell us your name, please? Charles Walker. Mr. Walker, you claim you walk barefoot on broken glass. Yes, sir. How does this happen? Don't you like shoes and sidewalks? Well, let's go a little deeper than that, Art. It's actually a demonstration of mind over matter, and what uh, we, the average day human beings, can do in regards to, uh, uh, well, mind over matter, uh, due to uh, all maladies of certain types. Uh, how did this all start? You must start somewhere. Do you start by just walking on little uh, sharp blades and then work up to the real thing, or what? No, uh, <coughs> actually, art has started back in reservation days, as I call them. I was 18 years old and uh, I was staying with an Navajo family. And uh, through the shaman, or the medicine man there, at the time he seemed to think that I was actually seeking for guidance in, uh, in these, uh, what he would call occult matters, and I started studying them. The Navajo Indians taught you this matter of mind over matter. That's true. And do they walk on live coals and things like this? Very many of them do, Art. Have you ever done that? I have walked over hot coals. And you weren't burned? No. Uh, in the beginning, you uh, are taught more or less like uh, the gentleman with the snakes to get used to that type of element. You must be with it and work with it. And eventually, you've uh, established some type of contact from your subconscious mind with the element that you're walking 
with or over or also with the inanimate matter. Well, let's listen to the third gentleman. Your name? Charles Pays. Charles Pays. Yes, sir. Known as Charles Sneaky Eyes Pays. <laughs> she said it, not me. But at all events, Mr. Pays, you claim that you raise a snake-killing animal called the mongoose. Yes, sir. So you will never be friends with our first man here. I'm afraid not. Well, tell us about it. Where do you raise these mongooses? I have a place out in the desert near Victorville, about 100 miles east of here. Well, now, why should you want to kill his rattlesnakes? Well, they're one of the best things to kill snakes with because snakes get into camps, uh, boys' camps, girls' camps over the mountains in the summertime, and we take them up there to get them out of the camps because they're very dangerous around with their children. And then oftentimes people call me and want me to bring them out where there's uh, been a fire in a canyon and the snakes will get out of the canyon and get up around the homes and get into the homes. And these worry people who do not know that you can make friends with the snakes. That's right, sir. Well, now, uh, uh, wh where does the mongoose come from originally? It comes from India. It's a small animal about the size of a weasel. And does it always kill the snake? Well, very seldom misses. Well, how can a mongoose kill us a, a venomous snake, like a rattlesnake or a cobra? They have a very tough skin, tough hide, and they, when they're fighting, their, their fur comes up, stands straight up, and the skin, when the uh, snake strikes them, they can't get through that fur. And uh, the mongoose gets around them and grabs them by the neck and usually sinks their teeth into them. They have very sharp teeth. And they uh, sink those teeth into the back of their neck and that snake is gone. And they can kill almost any kind of a snake as much as a largest snake as a cobra. Now, when you get a call from somebody who wants to kill snakes that are in their vicinity, what do you do? Do you take one or two mongooses out there? Or how do you I'd work? I take about six. Can you loose. just let them loose? Turn them loose, yes, sir. And they'll, uh, they, when you turn them loose, they always know that they're going to get an egg when they come back. They're very fond of eggs. That's one of the delicacies that they love. So that you uh, know they're going to come back for their eggs. That's right, sir. Now, having heard the three stories, do you wish to make a change in mind? If you do not change your mind, you can win 2,000 if you are right. But you can only win 1,000 if you want to change your mind on the basis of what you've heard. Now, one is liar. One is liar. He has the only profession that makes any sense. Who? Uh, the last one with the sneaky eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've heard all three. The first man raises rattlesnakes. The second man walks on glass. That's two very silly things. <laughs> I think he's telling the truth. You think the... You, uh, what I want you to do is point out which one is telling a lie, not which one's telling the oh, truth. That's... Now, if you're going to change your mind, then it, it costs a thousand dollars. Now, you understand that? Yes. All right. You want to change your mind and point somebody else out? Yes. All right. He's lying. The man with the rattlesnakes. Yes. Who raises rattlesnakes yes. is lying. Hmm? Well, I'll ask him and we'll find out. If you're right, you get $1,000 because you've changed your mind, which is a prerogative of any female, of course. <coughs> uh, Mr. Um, Bacigalupi. Right. <coughs> what do you truthfully do in the line of work? Tell me the truth. Well, my regular line of work, I'm a machinist. But? But. I do raise rattlesnakes as a hobby. You have just been taken out of $1,000, $2,000. But you have a chance to make $500. Now we have the next two. The man who walks on glass and the man who raises mongooses for $500. Which one? He walks on glass and, and he's lying. All right. You, you say he lies. Your name, please, sir, again? Charles Pays. Mr. Pays, you do raise mongooses to kill snakes? No, sir. What? No, sir. You do not? No, sir. Well. <laughs> you see, this is very interesting. If she had stuck to her intuition of a female, she'd have had $2,000. But 
you used your mind, which is a mistake. <laughs> and it cost you $1,500. You have won $500. What do you actually do for a living? I'm a chauffeur with Tanner Motor Livery, sightseeing. He's Tessie. a chauffeur. And now our final gentleman, your name? Charles Walker. And Mr. Walker, you do walk on glass. Yes, sir, I do. Would you haul away the... Now we have in back of Mr. Walker a long trough filled with cut glass of all kinds, not panes of glass, but the actual sharp edges of curved glass standing up from one end of this six foot long trough to the other. In order to further dram dramatize his ability of mind over matter, he has a heavy weight. Would you take the weight which helps to put you down into the glass? Can I see the bottoms of your feet, please? Ordinary foot bottoms, right? There you are. Nothing on them. Is that right? That is correct. Would you show us now what happens when you really have achieved mind over matter? What are you putting in your coat pocket? Well, this is uh, part of my Indian paraphernalia. And, I didn't uh, see this before. This uh, is something to help you? That's right. This is a trigger to the subconscious mind. Otherwise, uh, an outside spin. All right, would you stand please, back, please, a little further, Mr. Pays? Thank you. All right, you can put that in your pocket. I never saw that before. Real Indian feathers. Do you want me to walk with this? Yes, you can walk with the, with the cord, if you wish. Come down to the other end, would you please? I see the bottom of your feet, please? Yes, sir. No cuts? No cuts. And those are very, very sharp glasses. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to have our three special guests each have a portable TV from Spiegel, Chicago's famous mail order house. And thanks for proving that women are funny. gentlemen, our next guest might win this $1,000 bill. Then again, he might not. We're going to prove that people are funny about how much they can remember. You know, there are actually schools where you can go and train your memory muscles. We want to test a young man who has just graduated from the Bornstein School of Memory here in Los Angeles. Would you come out, please? How do you do? You're sort of a young fellow be good to be going to a memory school. How old are you? Sixteen. Sixteen? Your voice has changed already, hasn't it? Yes. <laughs> What's your name? Jay Noodleman. Mr. Noodleman, what do you do? Where do you go to school? L.A. High School. Why are you going to a memory school? So I can help get my grades up higher. Which is your weakest subject? Has Science. been. Science. Uh -huh. And uh, now that you've gone to the memory school, you find that you're able to remember formulas? Mm, fairly easy. What has been the subject best improved by your training in memory school? History. Dates and all those sort of things. Yeah. How long have you been going to Bornstein School? About six months. And how many are in a class? Mm, around 30. And uh, how long does a class last when you're training your memory? Oh, it takes about three hours. Uh, and you learn such things as how to remember names, places, and people, and things like that? Yes. Now, you've graduated. Yes. You're ready to go out in the world and remember who you are and who you met. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Jay. We're going to see if or your mind and your memory can meet the test. And we're going to show you a little scene. See this little theater we have back of us here? We're going to show you a scene. And during the action, you will see 10 different objects. Now, what goes on with those objects is of no importance, the action. But what they are and the order in which they appear is very important. Because after you've seen this scene, we're going to give you $50 for each item you can remember. So that if you get all 10, you get $500. <laughs> if you get them in the order they appear, we give you a bonus of $500, making a total of $1,000. So come on out here and turn around. And Pat McGeehan and Sandy White 
will give you a little action and then we will see how your memory works. Watch. Now turn around here. Right behind you, Jay, a big blackboard is being turned around with the 10 items written on it. But you can't turn around and see it. That's for our audience to check. Now remember, you will list the 10 objects in order, if you can. And you will be given 60 seconds, which is plenty of time. And you must go right from the top down. One time only. Ready? Go. The first object was a horn. Second then. object was a jack-in-the-box. Third object was a necklace. The fourth object... The fifth object... I'll skip the fourth object. The fifth object... Skip that one. The sixth object was a basket. The seventh was a Let's skip that one too. The eighth was a um ten seconds. Um uh, there was a uh, a cane was the ninth, uh, the tenth was a um no the tenth was a cane, the ninth was a um Banana. Just gonna get the eight, well, we'll allow the banana. It came one second after the <laughs> bell had rung. But now turn around and look. You were right on the first one. Missed the tire in which the pearl necklace arrived. Got the jack in the box, but in the wrong order. Missed the fan, got the basket. Missed the walking toy and the squirt gun. I thought you'd surely remember that gun. <laughs> Banana and candy cane. So you got a total of six out of the ten, but in the wrong order, which proves that you still have a little work to do on your memory, slightly. It's a tough, I don't know how you folks did in the audience. I know you're all comparing your own scores with his, but six times 50 makes $300. And that's not so bad for a few minutes work, is it? No. Good luck to you wherever you go, and remember your way home, will you? 